one week at a time. Sunday nights will never be the same. The week starts here, 7.30 to 9 p.m., right here on 94.1 KPFA. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. Making, making Contact. Making, 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 making Contact. This is Making Contact, and I'm Rose Aguilar with a special roundtable discussion on reproductive health and abortion rights 43 years after Roe v. Wade. Joining me is Corinne Rivera Fowler, Deputy Director of Calor, the Colorado Organization for Latina Opportunity and Reproductive Rights, and Carol Joffe, Professor at the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health at the University of California, San Francisco, and author of many books, including Dispatches from the Abortion Wars, the cost of fanaticism to doctors, patients, and the rest of us. Corinne and Carol, thank you both for joining us. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, there is so much to talk about. In 2015, lawmakers introduced 396 provisions aimed at restricting abortion. This is according to a new report from the Guttmacher Institute. By the end of the year, 17 states enacted 57 new restrictions, including longer waiting periods, banning second trimester abortions, and new clinic restrictions. A restriction that passed in Texas caused 23 clinics out of 42 to close. And as a result, many women have tried to self-induce abortions. And then in September, a 35-year-old woman in Tennessee reportedly used a coat hanger to end her unwanted pregnancy. She has since been arrested and charged with murder. And on November 27, 2015, Robert Lewis Deere was arrested for a shooting rampage at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado Springs. Three people were killed, nine were wounded. During his first court appearance in December, Deere said, quote, I'm guilty. There's no trial. I'm a warrior for the babies, end quote. So this is what we're facing 43 years after the Roe v. Wade decision. And we're going to talk about the politics behind these restrictions and the violence. But first, let's talk about the women and the providers who have been affected by these attacks because their voices are often missing in the media coverage and the national conversation. So, Carol Joffe, you've written books about providers. You're in touch with providers across the country. What are you hearing from them right now? Uh, well, really two different messages. Uh, one, enormously demoralized uh, by the attack in Colorado Springs, obviously. Um, since the release of the videos of, of Planned Parenthood, uh, the so-called sting of Planned Parenthood that falsely showed, that falsely claimed uh, that Planned Parenthood was, quote, selling baby parts, which is absolutely not true. Uh, many clinics, not just in Colorado, uh, have been met with violence, fire bombings, death threats to providers. So on one hand, very demoralizing. Demoralizing also because of the many restrictions that have caused clinics to close. Uh, but at the same time, a resoluteness an absolute commitment to keep going with this work. And what I would say very quickly about most of the abortion providers, and, and I should say, when I say abortion providers, I'm not speaking just of the clinicians, the doctors, and in some cases nurses. I'm speaking of receptionists. I'm speaking of uh, counselors, all the people who work in clinics. Uh, for them, this work is not just work. This work is a mission. Um, so even though they are deeply demoralized and have some concerns for their safety, they are also absolutely committed uh, to go on with this work. And, and even the security guards, because they're the That's ones right. that are that outside is, in many cases that is as true. the women go into the clinic. Absolutely. Corinne, you are in Colorado. What are you hearing from women, especially women of color and women living in marginalized communities? You know, we're really deeply saddened to be living in a time when um, shocking acts of violence like this are occurring. And, you know, it, we have to first acknowledge that this um, this recent act of violence is a result of um, false allegations that were made about Planned Parenthood and other uh, providers. And these are really 
health care professionals, health care providers that provide a service to women of all types, families, men are accessing these services at these clinics and health care um, places. And um, we are saddened that our leaders are taking the, the stand of, of uh, defending this violence and, and actually um, encouraging it. And so it, it's just so difficult for us to see that the response to this shooting from so many has been negativity and not standing with those healthcare professionals who are doing their duty um, and upholding what the, the services that are needed by low income community, income community communities, communities of color, and all communities. Um, these services are, are valuable, and um, that, that someone would go in and attack the people who are inside of these, these clinics is just terrible for us, and it's been a horrific tragedy to deal with. The Colorado shooting didn't result in much of a conversation about clinic violence because of the San Bernardino shooting, which happened right after the Colorado Spring shooting, and so attention was quickly diverted. Corinne, can you elaborate on what you just said in terms of how politicians have been responding to what happened at Planned Parenthood? I mean, honestly, um, in Colorado, you know, we saw very immediately following the um, shooting in Colorado Springs, we saw comments made by a particular representative. Um, we are a C3 organization, um, but this representative, Representative Windholz, who is out of Aurora, Colorado, actually um, posted on her Facebook page that Planned Parenthood incited this act of violence because she said that they were doing violence inside of their clinic. And she, you know, supported what had happened and blamed it on the clinicians. Um, the very Monday following the Friday um, violence at the health center, um, there was a hearing to consider um, the Colorado Family Planning Initiative, the long-acting reversible contraceptive funding in our joint budget committee, and um, legislators were bringing up the uh, videos of Planned Parenthood and the purported selling of body parts during that hearing. And it was deeply saddening for our community to have these legislators uh, speaking in these ways when something so terrible and tragic had just happened. Mm. Carol, you say that the Colorado Springs shooting is different from past shootings because Robert Louis Deere, the shooter, did not appear to specifically target a provider. Instead, he targeted the Planned Parenthood clinic and anyone who happened to be there. Yes, that, that's correct. It, um, all the previous shootings had really been aimed at providers. Um, again, providers not meaning just doctors, but uh, a security guard was killed in Alabama. A volunteer escort was killed in Florida. But in, uh, it, what's interesting to me and very disturbing with respect to Robert Deere, the shooter, uh, was not just that Planned Parenthood was the target and anybody who happened to be in his way. Uh, interestingly, one of the people he killed, uh, a policeman who came to the scene, turns out he was devoutly anti-abortion. Um, but what was interesting to me about this shooting is that Robert Deere d did not have a history of being a, a part of an organized anti-abortion group. He was clearly a disturbed individual who had very strong anti-government feelings. Uh, he fit the profile of the angry extremist white male. Uh, in other situations, he would have gone and shot up at a government building like Timothy McVeigh in, uh, you know, in the mid 90s. And, and it's just very striking to me that Planned Parenthood s seemingly has become the target of choice, at least in this case, for a disturbed, angry individual with a whole list of grievances. How do you think the pro choice community is dealing with this, specifically the rhetoric that is coming out of? politicians and people like Robert Louis Deere, how do you think they should respond in the coming year? 
Well, I think they're doing the best they can. I mean, Cecile Richards, the uh, president of Planned Parenthood, was summoned to Congress and was subjected to a, you know, a tongue lashing, and she held her ground very well. Uh, the CEO of Planned Parenthood in Colorado, Vicki Cowart, uh, from you know, from the minute this happened, very strongly defended um, her clinic and uh, and her patients and her staff. Uh, I think the pro-choice community has done its best to call on others to stop demonizing, to stop inciting uh, rhetoric, which we have seen from uh, virtually all the Republican candidates. Uh, but it's really, it's not really under control of the pro-choice movement. Uh, you know, responsible figures within the anti-abortion movement, within the Republican Party, it is up to them to say, look, we can disagree about abortion, but we absolutely have to stop this rhetoric. We have to stop propagating the lies. I mean, Planned Parenthood does not sell body parts. Uh, a number of the clinics that have been bombed, for example, in Southern California and Thousand Oaks and in Washington State, they don't even donate uh, mm -hmm. fetal tissue. So it, it is really not, I mean, the pro, well, let me put it this way. The pro-choice movement is doing the best it can, but it's not ultimately under their control. Can I respond I, to that, that as well? Sure. Oh, sure. Corinne. I think that as far as I can speak for Colorado and some of the allies that we have across the nation, and here in Colorado we have a reproductive health rights and justice coalition that is very diverse and includes the faith community, um, NARAL, Planned Parenthood, Calor, and the ACLU. And what we are doing this year is being proactive. Um, we were one of those states last year where multiple pieces of legislation were introduced, as in other states, and we were able to defend ourselves and not one piece of legislation that would have removed access to reproductive health care passed in our state. Um, we did that by standing together in unity and by propping up and working with champion legislators here in our state who do stand with women and families and who do stand for equality and self-determination and really justice, which what this is all about. And so we are working with legislators this year. We plan to introduce with those legislature, legislators at least five pieces of proactive legislation, which will expand access to birth control, expand access to um, health care services that are so needed and to economic justice um, things like pregnancy fairness. And we're working to take back this narrative. We will not stand in side of their narrative and play games fighting back their rhetoric because we need to control this. We um, There are things that we can be working on. We need to diversify our coalition further. Um, there are women's groups all across the nation that have not been active in the, quote, choice movement, um, women's leagues, women's lobbies, children's advocates that we are working to um, build coalition and relationships with because those voices need to be heard in these hearings. And I feel like the, the mainstream needs to get active because we know that women and men across this nation support access to all reproductive health care for all women. And we need to get louder about it and make sure that the legislators that are running these bills understand that their seats will not be safe and they will not be reelected if they continue to run these kinds of agendas that really don't better our communities. So I think that's what we can be doing and that's what we are going to do here in the state of Colorado. We are going to work to make sure that the voices of women and families are heard at the legislature this year and not drowned out by these anti-justice um, individuals who work against us. Carol, you mentioned the investigations earlier and the Senate asking Cecile Richards to testify on Capitol Hill. The investigations found no wrongdoing at all, and yet the media barely reported on this. And it's also important, Corinne, as you're talking about legislation in Colorado, when you look at the numbers, the anti-choice legislation passes when politicians introduce the bills and vote on them. But when the legis or when these bills, propositions, for example, go to the voters, 
the voters in the most conservative parts of the country always say no mm -hmm. to these anti-choice propositions. And Corinne, that happened in Colorado. Exactly. It's actually happened yeah. three times um, so mm -hmm. far. Um, you know, we have, as a state, voted on whether or not personhood should be defined in our state constitution um, three times now. And we have soundly defeated that legislation by a sizable margin in the 60s and 70s. And here we go and we see our legislators bringing back legislation um, attempting to define personhood. And so I feel that as advocates and community organizers and community leaders, we need to make sure that the voters and the legislators are more connected and that the legislators understand the will of their people and the individuals that put them in office. They do not want to see these anti um access and anti-reproductive health bills being considered in their legislatures. They, they've already uh, made their opinion known at the ballot box, and they would actually appreciate seeing some economic security legislation, legislation around expanding education, jobs. You know, Colorado has a housing, uh, affordable housing issue that is, you know, very prominent and, and very much needed. We don't see our legislators um, on the conservative side working hard to expand opportunities for hardworking Coloradans. We would like to see them spend their attention on that rather than having us fight with them about birth control every year. Well, hold that thought. We're going to discuss some positive news coming out of Colorado, and we'll also hear hopes for reproductive justice going forward right after this break. You're listening to Making Contact. Because of generous support from listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Aguilar, and with me is Corinne Rivera Fowler, Deputy Director of Color, the Colorado Organization for Latina Opportunity and Reproductive Rights, and Carol Joffe, Professor at the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, before the break, Carol, we were talking about how when the voters decide, they almost always say they don't want anti-choice legislation on the books. Can you remind us what the polling says about where the public stands on Roe and birth control? Because the media often tell us that abortion is one of the most controversial issues of our time. Uh, well, it is controversial in the sense that, that it, it keeps coming up again and again and again. In terms of the polling, uh, about 20% of the American public uh, is hardcore opposed to abortion in any cases. Uh, the rest uh, approve abortion uh, in in some, if not all, circumstances. So it's I mean, polling on abortion is notoriously complicated because how it depends how you ask the question. But again and again. Uh, more people want Roe to be the law of the land than don't. And in fact, uh, what's very interesting is that since this whole disaster with the videos and the, and the sting and the false accusations against Planned Parenthood, uh, support for legal abortion has actually gone up considerably, I think seven points. Uh, Planned Parenthood's approval ratings have stayed steady. Planned Parenthood's approval rating is above 45%. That's three times as much as Congress, uh, even more than the Republican Party. 60% of the American people uh, don't want Planned Parenthood defunded. Uh, so there is really a disconnect between what legislators are doing and what voters are, or I should say what the public is saying, because crucial to understanding all this is realizing that we are a nation that doesn't vote that much. 39% in the last midterms. If we get 65% in a presidential election, that's considered a lot. 
compared to other countries that get 99%. The point is, if everybody who really felt strongly about these issues voted, uh, the, the, the kind of legislator that Corinne is talking about in Colorado and elsewhere, they would be voted out of office. The problem is getting people to vote. And the voter suppression efforts of the Republican Party are not helping very much, to, to put it mildly. Corinne, what are your thoughts on that? I just want to thank Carol for saying that. You could, I couldn't have said it better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody <laughs> needs to go vote. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I said that earlier, that, it, that this is the case in Colorado. Um, we have a majority of people who have, have voted and, and said that they support access to health care and health care, all, all forms of contraceptive. They support, you know, um, keeping a woman's right to choose her and have self-determination. And we don't see that at the legislature. And um, especially um, we were furiously disappointed um, when our legislators voted down our long-acting reversible contraceptive program last year, which um, had tremendous results um, providing um, IUDs and long forms of contraceptive to low-income women, women who can't access birth control in other ways. Um, this program had been funded through a private donor. It was um, uh, funded for five years and the results in that five short year period were tremendous. Unintended pregnancies dropped by f more than 40 percent. Um, fo more women were able to plan and space out their pregnancies, stay in school, um, stay in their jobs, do whatever they decided to do. And we asked our legislators to uh, vote to refund that program and um, the, the conservatives, the same conservatives who were voting to restrict access to health care services also voted to defund that program. And so there's this conundrum there that doesn't make any sense to us. Um, if you don't support a woman going out and getting an abortion, then why would you not go ahead and allow them to have more access to decision making and allow them to control their body so that maybe they won't ever have to get to a place to have to make that difficult decision of whether or not to have a child. I just want to repeat that percentage. So because of this program, privately funded, it provides IUDs to low-income teens and women in Colorado. It has cut unintended pregnancies by more than 40%. Carol, that is a huge percentage. It is absolutely huge, and I agree with Corinne. It, it, it just defies belief that why would you, if you're against abortion, why would you not, not approve this program? Part of the answer, is, and it's not a very satisfactory answer, is that many conservatives have defined long-acting reversible contraception as itself uh, an abortifacient. That is something that causes abortion. The medical community flatly uh, disagrees with this. Uh, it is not. It does not disrupt an established pregnancy. Uh, conservatives, many of them, believe otherwise. And um, I would say uh, that th those conservative legislators in Colorado who voted against this program, I, I, I can only. I don't know the inside story, but I can imagine that in their hearts, they thought it was not a bad thing, in fact, a good thing, but they knew they would probably be primaried from the right if they didn't vote for this program. I think, Excuse you're, me, if they I think you're right on. This program. I think you're right on with that, that it's a political agenda to restrict access to women and their choices, period. That they are not looking at the evidence of this program. They're not looking at the positive effects that it has on our community in the long term. That women who are able to plan out their pregnancies, stay in school, choose their career paths, that they're not looking at the value to our communities. They're not even considering it. It's completely irrational. They're doing it because of political purposes and because of this rhetoric from the conservatives that all conservatives must stand in line against women and families, and that's what we're seeing. It has nothing to do with rationality. So Republican lawmakers killed the bill that would have continued the funding, but Corinne, isn't it true that foundations have stepped in to continue the funding until the middle of 2016? 
Yeah, there was a stopgap measure that some private foundations did step in, and the program, which would have ended on July 1st of this year, has continued. We are now working again at the legislature with the Department of Health and Environment and many other advocates, including the governor's office, to attempt to ensure that this program is funded, that it is part of our state budget, and that it does continue. Um, We are very hopeful. You know, we had bipartisan support. I want to say that we had bipartisan support in the House on this bill. I believe that um, we will see that same support in the House. And we've seen in Colorado um, some polarizing, a polarizing nature in our Senate. And uh, in the Senate, it's we haven't been able to have the thoughtful conversations that around this particular issue that we've been able to have in the House. And we hope that we can have a thoughtful conversation with some legislators whose um, districts would really, um, you know, have just positive results. It's the women in some of these districts, there is no other access for them. And um, some of these legislators, I hope that they consider their constituency, the young women in their in their districts who do not have access otherwise and what this really does mean to them. I'm, I'm hoping that that's possible. Speaking of the women who have access to this program, Corinne, there are some concerns about this program because it specifically targets poor women and women of color, women in marginalized communities. What are your thoughts on that? You know, as a reproductive justice organization, um, we have to acknowledge that there's a stigmatization, a historic stigmatization around government provided um, forms of birth control and that there actually has been times in our history that um, there have been forced sterilizations that have occurred in our communities, in the Latina community, in the Native American community, in the African American community. Um, that has that is a real fact, and we have you know worked hard to understand that long acting reversible contraceptive is a very effective form of birth control. Um, it allows a woman to you know have birth control for long periods of time to not have to um, rely on memory on daily memory to take um, birth control and it is is the most effective and cost effective form and so the trust there is a trust issue there and for some women um, that has been brought up and we have worked hard to help our community um, feel comfortable with this and understand that um, this isn't similar to past situations that where um, our communities, you know, um, could not trust government interventions. And so there is, that is a real fact and something that we do have to deal with and talk with our community with. Carol, what could we accomplish if free contraception were offered across the country, given the fact that 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unintended? It's an astonishing figure. Um, and hopefully, uh, as Programs like that in Colorado uh, go on. We'll see it reduced. But the, the sky is the limit if we were not fighting these battles. Uh, if families could plan, their, could space their children. We don't talk about child spacing that much, but it makes for a lot healthier children and less stress on parents if children are spaced. If... Um, if people could have the families they wanted, whether that means no children or some children, um, we would be a much happier, healthier society. And I take, in spite of how demoralizing the situation is now, I take hope with organizations such as Corrine, who are fighting the good fight every day. And I, Corrine, I wish you and your colleagues the best of luck. Well, I would love to continue this discussion, but we will have to leave it there. Carol Jaffe is professor at the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health at the University of California, San Francisco. Corinne Rivera Fowler is deputy director of Color, the Colorado Organization for Latina Opportunity and Reproductive Rights. Carol and Corinne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Making Contact will continue its coverage of reproductive health and justice, so we welcome your comments and program ideas at our website, radioproject.org. And that's where you can also listen to past shows or get our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, or link to our Twitter or Facebook page. 
Special thanks this week to the Mary Wolford Foundation and to Jim Richards, our technician at the University of California Berkeley Journalism School Studio. The Making Contact team includes Laura Flynn, Jasmine Lopez, Quan Booth, Alice Wong, and Lisa Rudman. I'm Rose Aguilar, your host this week. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Is making a difference important to you? Is charitable giving one of your core values? Like many people, you'd like to know that the causes and organizations you care about today will continue to thrive in the future. In addition to supporting the work of KPFA through cash donations, consider making a planned gift. It's easy and provides tax benefits as well. Simply put, planned giving is the transfer of assets to a designated nonprofit organization during your lifetime or as part of an estate plan. You can gift KPFA in your will or trust with stocks, real estate, or any amount of money. In return, you'll receive a generous tax benefit. For more information on plan 